We, we, Jesus has no a projector. <laughs> and he communicated, isn't yes. it? Yes. So as she's working on it, we shall deal with it. Let me say three things at the introduction. Number one, which we need to hear. Anake is ungodly. Anake is ungodly. Every time you are involved in something that is anarchy. Anarchy means everybody can do whatever they choose. Paul teaches us that everything in church must be done in order. So you need to, uh, if you don't hear any other thing I say, let that come out clear. That anarchy is? Yeah. In fact, I'm trying to say it's diabolical, but I'm, I don't know to go that far. So the moment you are involved in something and everybody can do anything, anytime, that means there is no control. You are not in a spiritually mature place. And the earlier you change it, the better. Anarchy is not biblical. It's not godly. Number two, that fallen man does not like order. <laughs> fallen man does not like order. <laughs> we have just learned that 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 to be disorganized is not godly. But the truth is, all of us want to be leaders at the same time. Very few of us. And that's why anybody who becomes a pastor or a chairman of the, the head of the stupid, uh, of Sunday school, whatever, you have invited yourself into criticism. The only way of avoiding being criticized, don't take a leadership role. Because the moment you take, people simply don't like leadership. They want, they want to be leaders themselves. So they wonder, what does he have I don't have? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> like he speaks in tongues, I'm also speaking in tongues. In fact, mine are more fluent. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So why? What do they have? So it's very important to understand, and that's very, I'm giving them introduction, but they are very critical. Mm -hmm. That you need to understand human beings don't like being led, don't like being ordered around, don't like order. They want everyone to do whatever, they and that's very important. So you need to understand that as a leader, <laughs> so that when you are criticized, you don't feel unhappy yeah. because you knew you would be criticized anyway. And if they don't criticize you, you need to be very suspicious. Because there are great possibilities you are achieving nothing. Now, the moment you achieve nothing, there's no criticism, is it? These are the kind of leaders we want. To allow us to do whatever we, we want. want. So therefore, they have no problem with you. The moment you create order, which Paul talked about, why are you telling me to come at 10, on, on, at 10 o'clock? Why can't I come at 4? Just because you like waking up early, me, I like waking up at me at mid midday. But son, son, the service has to be at a certain time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the pastor has to say some time, isn't it? Yes. But he will be hated for putting at 10 o'clock by people who like to wake up at midday. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand that is a critical thing. You know that. Thirdly, and we are still talking about leadership, thirdly, that there is no church growth without order. Mm. There is no church growth without order. order. And, and it's a very important thing to have at the back of your mind that uh, when you are disorganized, nothing will be achieved. Let's look, if you don't mind, I want to ask people at the very far back to read for me. Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to 27. Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to 27. Whoever is the first to, when you are younger, we to be, draw your sword. And whoever is the first to get the sword would be congratulated. So who is drawing the sword first? Luke 22, verse 24 to 27. Just stand up and read. Please. And you tell us which version. Thank you. 
Chapter 22, your sword was not fully drawn. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes. Um, and there, verses 24, and there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over, over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the servant. Who is greater, the one who is reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Have you heard? Yes. These are the twelve apostles. The cream of Christianity. And they say, but I should be your leader, isn't it? I'm called James. Peter is not as good a name as James. So James should become? Isn't that what they are discussing? So I, want, I, I like being biblical. So that you don't start giving, saying my statements are, are strange. They are biblical statements. People simply, everyone wants to be a leader. And that's what creates confusion. Because everybody wants to be a leader, you need to understand the confusion stops church growth. If you want the church to grow, you must create order. And when you create order, some people will run away from the church. The bad ones. You don't need them anyway. So, <laughs> if you really want church growth, let the bad ones, don't chase them away. If they choose to go, let them Oh, there must be order in your church. Because it is that order that will attract people in and while they are attracted and properly organized, they will do evangelism and the church will grow bigger. Am I communicating? But once you say, no, 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 don't touch them. Don't touch them. Don't touch the Lord's anointed. Now, you need to understand in the process of not touching that anointed, there will be confusion in your church and there will be no church growth. Are we together? Yeah. Those are the three basic things you need to have at the back of your mind even as you go through this, this training. We've just been speaking with a neighbor of mine and when he had, I come from Sitam, I used to be, I'm the founding secretary to the council of elders, the, the one that employs pastors. The first, the first secretary, because bishop is normally the, chair, the chairman. So we created structures, and I'm grateful to God. Many years later, those structures are still running. Twenty years later, well, after creating the, they are running. And I'm told by my neighbor, I was talking that when they hear Sitam is coming to a town, the pastor say, "Hi, they will take our members." So I say, "Do they actually take members?" No, members are waiting to run. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw being a being. Being a, being a Sitam person, I, I wanted to find out what really happens. So it's not that Sitam looks for them. They are waiting for the announcement. As soon as they arrive, they go. When you, since I preach in many churches, I do know that there is nothing very, very strange Sitam is preaching that is not in other churches. Yeah, because I'm, I, I, by the grace of God over the last number of years, I moved from church to church. This, this whole month, I was a speaker at All Saints Cathedral. They gave me the whole month. So I preach everywhere. But I can tell you, since I'm from Sitam, they are not preaching anything different. Why do people run there? Structure. Structure. <laughs> because if people, you know, like I'm from Valley Road, when people, Valley Road is so big that when people hear there's a new church, they run there. And, I tell, and they tell me because they are tired of being in a big church. They are going to go to a small one. Next time I'm invited there, I tell them, where do you run to? Because that one is over a thousand. It's no longer small. Are we together? Yeah. How does it? And remember the intention of people leaving was to be in a small church. church. Then the church has become big. big. Why? Structure. I don't see anything according to my assessment. I don't see anything else they have other than 
structure. Let me give you three things just to see what you are talking about. Structure. You cannot become a pastor in Sitam unless you have a certificate from a Bible school. You must be a graduate in Bible before you can be a pastor. That means you don't just wake up and say, I'm a pastor. No, there, has to be a, there has to be a process. You must show you have gone through Bible school. Are we together? Yes. When we introduced that, that one, I was still the Secretary of the Council of Elders. People said, it has the Holy Spirit come through degrees. <laughs> I can remember we were here in trouble at the Elders Council because people were saying, these people, where did the Holy Spirit come through degrees? I said, no, no, the Holy Spirit comes to people with degrees and without degrees. We are an English-speaking church. So English has to be taught, isn't it? And when you go to Bible school, you now learn how to speak English in the Bible. Am I communicating? So why, since both of them are full of the Holy Spirit, why not pick the one who can speak English in an English-speaking church? And of course, you are very fair. All our pastors who had diploma were sponsored to make it a degree. Wow. Wow. They did not have, no pastor needed to leave, except the one who refused in school. <laughs> so it was not that we are creating a rule to throw away pastors. It required everybody to have. And after that, many of, many of the pastors in Sitam have more than a, have one degree. Am I right? Those from Sitam, they have more than one degree. So that, that, that one was fought to than nail. Yeah. But you see, it has created something that nobody comes who has not had time to hear God, time to think about whether he is hearing right as he is studying the Bible <laughs> before he can finally call himself a pastor. And even as you become a pastor, they give you time before they can ordain you. Am I communicating? That's structure. Remember, you're talking about structure. And it's a biblical foundation. Remember, our topic is about biblical foundations. Yeah, structure. Let me, give you, let me give you another one. You cannot become a member of Sitam unless you have attended the church for more than a year. You have, where you came from, you're a pastor. You come to Sitam, you still have to stay there for a whole year before they can accept you. Not as a pastor, but as a, a member. But you know, people are so desperate for new members. They don't want him to change his mind and go back. No, you must stay a whole year. What, what does that do? It helps people who are just passing on and confused not to last. Because within a year, they are unconfused themselves. Are we together? And they said they don't want to become members. Because by becoming member, you have to register for a class. You have to be taught. You have to be interviewed by elders. You, you don't just declare yourself a member. And then your names have been to be posted like it's a wedding, like you are getting married. That these, the following people want to be members. Do you know a reason why <laughs> they cannot become members. members? So, of course, if you have a third wife, somebody in the church knows. And they say, that one, you want him to become a member? He has one in Mombasa and another one in Kemeriri. Am I communicating? Yes. That structure, it will slow down your growth. But it ensures those who come in truly have thought about what they are going. You know, again, it is based on scripture. Scripture says, do not be quick to lay hands on people. Is that in the Bible? Yes. Yeah. That means, it's not that they are not full of the Holy Spirit. You are just giving yourself time to watch. Are we together? Yes. And it's very, very important to, to, understand, to understand that. Let me give you a third, a third thing that is there. That if you become our CEO, the bishop, will not allow you more than five years. The contract is five years. And if, you are, if we agree with you another five years, once they are ten, you are back to being a pastor. In other words, uh, like Bishop Okinde, Bishop Adoyo, were all leaders, isn't it? When they finish their time, they go back to being pastors. Because you are not called to be a bishop. You are called to be a pastor. So you are not removing your calling. Go back to your calling. Bishop was administrative. Bishop was the only administrative. And you helped us for 10 years, allow somebody else to also serve. Am I communicating? Yeah, it means if you are my bishop, even if you don't like me and I don't like you, I can wait 10 years. <laughs> There's no need of fighting. Why should we fight with one another? Am I communicating? 
You know, like I was an elder for many years. Now I'm nothing. That's the way it is structured. You can't be an elder forever. Other people now, I'm over 70. So surely, I'm, how did, did I train anybody? Are you getting the point? Yes. That time limit is something that is very, very important. Do you know, in the Old Testament, as a, a, as priest was not allowed to continue after age 50. Mm -hmm. And you know, 50 is a very young boy, yes. 20 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. But they were told to stop. They can only help. Let the people between that and 50 continue. We others are their advisors. That the Old Testament priests. We are talking about structure. And I'm not suggesting these structure are the only ones. All I'm saying, you, if you really want church growth, you must create structure. structure. You don't, don't copy sit them once. Mm. Have you us, but they must be biblical. Mm. You must be able to show me from the Bible, where like I've just shown you where some limits come in. <laughs> where you are getting the idea from. So if, if you don't hear anything else during this class, those three points are the ones I wanted to deliver before we come to, we come to details. So that as you go in back to your church, you ask yourself, are you conscious about those three things? And what are you doing that are helping, um, that are helping, why, why is it, did it work? Oh, now it works. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted us to start, to start with. But Jesus has con confirmed my assumptions. Even the apostles, everybody wants to be a leader. To be, so you, that should be something you, you are aware about. I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about um, transformation leadership. Then I'll talk about ministers or pastors' role in the church leadership. Then I'll look at um, some distinction between a leader and a manager. And then I'll conclude by looking at various types of leadership styles. Um, there are two types of leaders. And a pastor is a leader. Two types of leaders. They are what we call transformational leaders and trans transactional leaders. And it's important to ask yourself, which of the two are you? I want to ask the people at the back, you know, they are the ones who can draw this in an afternoon. Somebody else to read what is on the board. <laughs> people at the far back. Transformational leaders know how to encourage inspire and motivate employees to perform in ways that create meaningful change. Keep reading. Transactional leaders. Now you want to compare transactional leaders. Transactional leaders. Transactional leaders, also known as managerial leader, leadership, is a leadership style where leaders rely on rewards and punishments to achieve optimal job performance from there. A pastor, a pastor who is a transactional leader is always, scratch my back and I scratch? Yes. Back. If you do this, I will promote you in church. Because it's give and take. take. That's a tra transactional person. Keep reading. The transactional executive leadership model is based on an exchange or transaction. Difficult, di difficult in a is my conclusion. Because if you are a transactional leader as a pastor, what do you offer? First of all, you are giving me work, and then after that you ask me to pay. Instead of paying me, I'm paying for working. You know, that's what happens in church. You tell me to be teach Sunday school, then you tell me about a few times. <laughs> so a transactional leader is a person who says, do this and I do this for you. Do this and I do this. That's why Jesus taught against it. He said, in a church, we need servant leaders mm. who are actually transformational leaders, <laughs> not transactional leaders. You should not be in a church because of what you get. You should be in a church because of what you give. Okay, there's the difference? Yeah, the reason why in church is it gives you opportunity to serve. Why are you there? Oh, I have opportunity to make a difference to the kingdom of God. And, and after that, I still have to pay my time. But the reason I'm here, I have opportunity to serve. 
That's really what you are calling transformational uh, leadership. And that's what you need to ask yourself, is that what your people are? It's difficult to, for, for in fact, I, I don't have the time, the time to go into this, but I keep telling people, if you don't have servant leadership, transformational type, chances are people keep leaving your church. Why? They realize you have nothing to offer. You promise something you cannot offer. So do not attract people to your church to get anything. Attract them to serve. You know, the pastor must avoid being a good Samaritan. You know who is a good Samaritan? You know the story of the good Samaritan? <coughs> the story of the good Samaritan is somebody who was going, then somebody has been hurt by, by robbers, he picks him, very good job. The Samaritan does a good job. Picks him, looks at his wounds, takes him to an inn, and also tells the innkeeper, look after him. Until I come. And all the bills I'll pay. Sure, you can't take such a risk. <laughs> Only Jesus can be the good. <laughs> we others are innkeepers. All the others are innkeepers. You serve members, but they pay nothing. You serve the pastor, he pays nothing. Why? The Samaritan is coming back. And all the bills. And you don't need. Somebody told me whether today I'll talk about marriage. Similarly, don't take your wife as a, don't be a good Samaritan to your wife. <laughs> be an enemy keeper. Because if you keep helping her and she keeps not uh, appreciating you, you will give up along the way. Because you are trying to serve her and she is not impressed. What about if you serve her and expect nothing from her? You serve her, she insults you, it's okay. I'll be paid for it. <laughs> So the reason why I'm looking after you is because the innkeeper gave me a job to look after you and promised me all my bills will be paid. Can you imagine your marriage was like that? <laughs> Where you know Christ is good Samaritan. You, as a husband, are an innkeeper. Okay, I'm speaking as a man. It's the same thing with men. A lot of women wonder, I cook for you, Ugali, I cook for you this, and then well, instead of even appreciating, you tell me the Ugali is like so. Now, you need to understand. <laughs> My sister, the moment you start dealing with your husband as an innkeeper, you always remember, even if this sick person, as all you see, does not, <laughs> does not respond. You don't think people are very difficult to look at her. Does not respond. One day, the good Samaritan woke up and pay all the bills. And that is the structure that will build for the church. The members, innkeepers. The pastor, innkeeper. The owner of the church, the good Samaritan. And he has told us to every day. This person is sick. Yeah, if you read this, add that, add that. Don't worry, keep writing. When I come back, I'll pay. That's really what you're talking about. So, that's why I told you it's difficult to be transactional in church. Because you, you don't have the ability to meet all the views that are there. Now, your neighbor can read. I see you have that good eyesight. <laughs> Leadership is a type of leadership used to grow and transform a community. It is a process where a leader can connect and interact with their followers and transform their life by increasing the level of morality and motivation. So, to be called a transitional leader, okay, transformational leader, it means you are more interested in the person than the trading. It's not about trading. Transitional leader is a um, sorry, transformational leadership style inspires part members, don't call them boring, to strive beyond required expectations, to work towards a shared vision. So the big, the big issue in leadership, transformational leadership, is the ability of the leader and the members to agree on the vision. <clears throat> so none is working for the other. We are working to realize our common vision. 
So if you really are a good leader, your biggest deliverable is getting everybody to have commonality of vision. My brother, you have actually won the day, the day they stop, they stop, they stop talking about the pastor's project. And they start talking about our project. As long as they are talking about the pastor's project, you're a failure. They must, you must reach a level where they say, it's not longer the pastor, it's our thing. But why are you selling another cow? We sold the other one for our project, not for the pastor. There will be marriage problems when the husband hears they are selling a cow for the pastor. Say, <laughs> funny, <laughs> It's very important to understand the biggest job of a transformational leader is to get the vision of the members to agree on a common vision with him so that everybody, nobody is working for the other. We are all working to us a common, common vision. That's really what we are talking about, and it's very important. Whereas sanctional leadership focuses more on extrinsic motivation for the performance of specific job tasks. You know, learning to balance these styles can help leaders each. Yeah. Now, if you are dealing with a small child, you may have to use transactional leadership. Finish your food with your food. Finish your food, I'll take it to your grandmother. Now. <laughs> Transaction. Are we together? Because the child is too small to understand this. <laughs> I'll get you the point. Yes. So, you need to come out of that transactional idea. Do this, I do this. Why don't we all agree what you want to achieve and we all work to us? That's why the Bible talks about it. It talks about the churches when you come together, one has a hymn, one has a song. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Yes. It's not the pastor everything. And that's the, the thing I the next thing I want to talk about. Um, I want you to now, since I'm, I'm I'm being unfair to you at the front, maybe just read just read. I don't keep asking only the back. Luke, read Luke 9 for us. Okay, Luke 9 is verse 10, right? Yeah. When apostles returned, they found that they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they would go by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About how many? Five thousand men were there. We don't. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Take the five loaves and two fish, and look up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. That's the whole story. A quick study of the sermon. Please suggest three or four items in the story that matter. Number uh, uh, earlier here, we know it is happening in the afternoon. Okay? Yes. We know it's happening in the afternoon. <clears throat> the next thing is people are hungry, not spiritually, but physically. <laughs> Number three, <laughs> nobody has food. Except the boy. Yeah, the boy. Yeah. Please note, there is a sitting down, there is a prayer, there is distribution of food, and there is collection of the remains. Which of those items took the longest? Hmm? Prayer is a minute, isn't it? Yes. What took the longest? Making 5,000 people in groups of 50. Those of you who are good in maths. How many groups were those? How many? 500. Can you imagine a crowd of people being told, you'll get food. I mean, that's where you sit down. 
Yeah. All of them want to sit near the food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it must have taken maybe two, three hours to get them to settle down. But then, the truth is, if Jesus had tried to tell them, this is the food, I'm going to feed you, you'd have been killed, you'd have run away. <laughs> and then they called Mary one boy. Now, you remember that story? If you are Kenyan, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. In Nyeri, when she was MP, she tried to feed people. You must have seen it in the TV. And she was almost run over. And Nyeri is not a place without food. Mm. But who doesn't like free food? Now, they over, <laughs> almost ran over. Can you see the wisdom of Jesus? Yes. That until they are all seated in groups of 50, and they are not 500, remember that these are men. Most likely for every, for every man there was a woman and several children. Am I right? Yes. The biggest job was administrative. It was structure. Simply structure. Remember that's our discussion today, isn't it? The work of miracle was quick. But it, for a miracle to happen, it required that we must have structure. I heard T.D. Jake say, and I've never forgotten it, that many, many churches, miracles are waiting to happen, because the work, miracle worker is ready, but they are not yet administratively settled. The reason why the miracle is not happening, he is still waiting for it to be organized. But you are so disorganized, he is still waiting. Because the miracle, no human being can do a miracle, only God. The work of a pastor is not to do miracles. It's to organize people. <laughs> That's what the apostles were doing. That's what the apostles were doing. Putting, putting them there. Jesus is the only one who will do the miracle. <laughs> but the pastors, the apostles, must put them in organization. So any church that does not actually spend enough time, that's what the main work of a pastor, organizing people so that God can do the miracle. I need to ask yourself, in your church, is that where you are? That, that is a biblical, Jesus is teaching us in this story, the importance of administration, the importance of structure. He knew a group bigger than 50 would be too big. A group smaller than 50 will make them too many groups. So he arrives at a certain level of structure. And because of that structure, we end up with the feeding, everyone is satisfied, and food actually remains. Am I communicating? Yes. Yes. So I thought that that's something you need to understand for this week. Whatever else you are learning, understand the place of organization. So that you do not fail to organize yourself. You know, one of the things I want to mention here, so that I emphasize that idea, that only Jesus can do miracles, is to talk about the priesthood of all believers. Uh, like I told you, I was in an, an Anglican church the whole month, so I know they, that's not their main, main subject. But Pentecostals, the Pentecostal church was established on the basis of priesthood of all believers. believers. That the Pentecostals believe the pastor may have the gifts of teaching, but a member who was saved yesterday may be doing miracles. Mm-hmm. And the pastor will allow them. Am I communicating? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The pastor may have been, like I've been preaching, uh, I've been preaching for more than 50 years. But um, another boy comes, and we are praying for the sick. And the leg just, you know, the, the leg just uh, gets longer. And me, I have never even done one day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the point. The, pen, the, uh, the priesthood of all believers means that it's the Holy Spirit who determines the ministry each person will get. And somebody who got the who got the gift yesterday may do something we who have been saved for long can never do. Yeah. That's why, in order to know maturity, spiritual maturity of a person, my sister, is not measured by gifts. That boy who is doing a miracle is still a baby Christian. Mm. But you don't Jesus, you don't tell Jesus, wait, why don't you allow him to grow? How can you know? Um, when we were young people, around 1970, there was a girl called Wangari in Banana. Mm. <laughs> Me, I was from six. 
or when she was a form two or form three. She started praying for people and miracles happening. Every flooded to banana. And she's a form three girl. She's praying for people and they're getting well. And you wonder, surely, can't you deal with the pastor? Surely, people have been to Bible school. Use Wangari. Am I communicating? Because you know, a lot of people want to serve the Lord in a special vacancy. You know what that vacancy is? <laughs> Advisor. <laughs> and unfortunately, the vacancy does not exist. <laughs> the scripture tells us he requires no advisors, isn't it? Yeah. So you need to understand that the priesthood of all believers means that somebody who got saved last week mm. will speak in a tongue, interpret it, and you that have been saved for 50 years can't do it. It means you must allow everybody in the church. The work of a pastor is to create order so that gifts can become operational mm. as God determines. Are we together? Yes. Order. Order that allows, allows you. And if you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it is order such that three people cannot talk at the same time. You have read 1 Corinthians 14, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think we'll be able to go to all that. Somewhere in the middle, my brother, just read now what's on the wall. New Testament doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. The word presbyteros is usually rendered elder, while the word episcopos is usually rendered bishop or overseer. The New Testament never speaks of any ministry as mediating between God and the church. Priesthood of all believers, of all believers, church leaders, which is an essential part of the biblical idea of the church. In, in the priesthood of all believers, there will still be church leaders. In other words, we are not trying to say there will be no church leaders. Just look at Ephesians 4. Go on. Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, from verse 11 to 12, it says, Some to be pastors and teachers, uh, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Can somebody read that one for me in King James? I continue. No, no. First of all, some read for me in King James. That's a nice energy. King James. Whichever you choose will be okay. 4, 11, and 12. Ephesians 4, 11, 12. The Bible says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. For the equipping. In other words, these are ministries in the church. Why do we need those ministries? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What's the work of a teacher, a pastor, an apostle? It is his job is to equip people, organize them, train them, equip them. For them to do what? According to James. Work of ministries. You know, I keep reading and saying pastors must have avoided it. Because we call pastors ministers. But according to these pastors are not ministers. The members of the church are the ones who are ministers. The work of the pastor is to equip them. That's where it's very to equip them. So they can do the work of ministry. You know, the guy at Kegayo, you know Kegayo Police College? That guy is a very senior guy. I think he's an assistant commissioner of police. Very senior. But you know on the road you cannot stop a vehicle. He is the one who trains all policemen, but he can't stop vehicles on the road. Even in job he is stopped. Because his work is to equip policemen to become traffic police. Am I communicating? To do the work. To do the work. The work of traffic management is not by the trainer, it's by the graduates. Are we together? So we as pastors. Our bigger and don't quote me, please look at the scripture. <laughs> <laughs> you are looking at me, you are unhappy. But, <laughs> the work of a pastor, an apostle, the lead was given, is to equip the, the saints for the work of ministry. So it is every member of the church must be equipped to do ministry. They met they met the uh, Lausanne Committee for Audio Visualization met in a place in Philippines in 1989. And on the basis of this, 
priesthood of all believers, came up with a statement about the mission. They say, talking about the mission of the church, they say, and you can Google it up, Lusanne, Kapitra, and you can Google it, it says, the mission of the church is for the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. <coughs> In other words, three things. Your work is to mobilize the whole church. In other words, if you want to know that you're a good pastor, ask on a Sunday how many people witness during the week. If only 10%, you have a need. <laughs> see, see, ten, 10 is a need. 10 out of 100 is a need. Am I right? If you have that percent, it's still a need. At least more than half of your church during the week should have witness, should have done ministry. Are we together? Because they work on Sunday to equip them for the work of ministry. So you know how successful you are as a pastor by the percentage of members involved in ministry. The whole church. Not some people. All, all, all church. So they say our mission is mobilization, not a part of the church, but the whole church. Number two, to take the whole gospel, not world health. You must be able to tell people, get saved. But by after getting saved, you might get persecuted. <coughs> Don't hide the fact that you will be persecuted. Well, that's part of the gospel. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So they say, if we really are involved in mission, the church must give the whole gospel. And finally, it must go to the whole world. So you need to ask in your church, how far is the gospel going? Not through the pastor, but through the people they have equipped you. I know some of us, at least I told you I come from Sita, and for, a, for about six years, I used to do a regional job. So on Sunday, I would be in Valero. By that afternoon, I'm going to the airport to fly to some country. I used to look after this region for Shell, from Djibouti, uh, Sudan, all the way to Madagascar, Mauritius. So I would always be flying to some place. And at the airport, I'll find somebody else who was in church. That means whatever we are told in church, we can take it to every corner of the world in that afternoon. Am I communicating? Yes. But you know what that happens? We hear it and leave it in church. Because the pastor has not equipped us to do anything. Our work is, what is your ministry? I'm an usher. Now surely, that's not a ministry. That's what we do together. Like when we are eating, <laughs> and the one with the chapatis, she will tell me, please pass on. What is your work, Mr. Nana? To pass chapatis. Surely. At least, at least make them chapatis. No, just pass chapatis. What is your ministry? I'm in the choir. That's not a ministry. That's passing on chapatis. When you come together, you help one another. Ministry is not done on Sunday. It's in the rest of the week. Wow. Then on Sunday we come to report <laughs> what God has been doing to us. Amen. And we bring the harvest. Amen. Not communicating. Yes. That's the responsibility of a pastor. And until your members stop regarding church work as ministry, you are very far from realizing your vision. I've written a book called The Christian Professional Living in the Marketplace. And the reason I wrote that one is because I kept being asked by people, Nana, when are you becoming a pastor? Nana, when are you becoming a pastor? Everybody asked me, so I wrote a book to answer the question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been preaching for more than 50 years, and I've never been a pastor even for half a day. Because I want everybody to know the work of going to talk about Christ, gossiping the gospel, is not the work of the pastor. <laughs> it's for people like Nana <laughs> who are not pastors. <laughs> My communicating. And you cannot talk about having biblical foundation for leadership in your system until you start understanding your mission as a pastor is to equip people for the work of ministry. ministry. Okay, you, you, this English calls it service, but it's the same. It's the same thing. Read on. You haven't finished. Uh, a pattern of multiple participation of the congregation seems to have been the mark of all the apostolic churches. The references. Romans 12, Romans 12 14, 14, go on. 
1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, uh, chapter 5 and verse 19, Colossians 3 and verse 16, Hebrews 10 and verse 24 and 25, verse Peter 4, uh, 10 to 11. In other words, the Bible is full of this idea of everybody involved in ministry. Everybody is a minister of the gospel. But the pastors are the organizers. Beating people in groups of so that Jesus can do the That's really what we are we are talking we are talking about. Read on, please, brother. Bible clearly, uh, plural, plural leadership. Plural leadership. Bible clearly teaches that only Christ is to be exalted, for he alone is the head of the church. Colossians 1 and verse 15 to 20, Matthew 23, verse 8 to 12. In Acts, Paul are always appointed elders. What's that? Not an elder. Not an elder for, <coughs> for the new churches. Yeah, he appointed elders, not an elder. Hence, do not attend someone else, my church. <laughs> okay, this is the point. Go to the book of Acts and discover. We are still talking about foundation, Hebrew foundation for leadership. Discover every church Paul established. And remember, they were meeting in people's houses. And however big the houses were, sisters would agree with me, they are, they, they are not used to having more than 50 people per church. These were all small churches, am I right? But not a single church was given one person. He never appointed an elder. You are disappointed? Yes. So you need to understand biblical foundation for leadership is plural leadership, not individual leadership. The church where there is a, a star, you know the star, the owner of the church, my church, is not a biblical church. A biblical church, nobody owns it. And I guess when we are talking about Sister Marito earlier, that's one of the things that attracts people. Because you come to a place, you establish a church, after some time you are transferred. You thought it was your church only to discover it's somebody else's. <laughs> when that one is about to say my church, you thought the transfer. <laughs> so in the end, all you have elders like me, who are elders for many years, you have a minute. You have finished your term. So everybody everywhere has been an elder, has been a dick god, has been a pastor, everyone has been everything. So when you say you're a pastor, you can't be proud because you can see three others who, who are there before you. Am I communicating? <laughs> Plurality of leadership. Sorry? Plurality of leadership means you do not have a single person leading. It's always single. You know this thing? I'm the vision. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't Paul have a vision bearer in those circles? <laughs> he never appointed a vision bearer. There were vision bearers. Yes. Am I communicating? Yes. But that's now the new the new Kenya is full of vision yes. bearers. They are touched, they are anointed of them. <coughs> and we're just telling him, brother, your English is not communicating. <laughs> Go and read the place of English. So who are you to tell the anointed? Of the Lord. Then fix what it is, you don't know it. <laughs> All we are saying is, you require two people who can help one another. So you need to understand, even if you, uh, you go to establish a church in Kitengela, you need to, as quickly as possible, like Paul did, establish a leadership structure. Where there is no particular person, the owner. I know you'll forgive me for saying this because I may touch on you. If I go on a road and see a church with a husband and wife, I don't even bother entering. But they have declared in advance it is their church. What business do I have with their church? And you know, people go there, then they excommunicate. They say, I want to do by India. What were you doing with somebody? <laughs> And they told you in advance, if they don't try to sit our church. You know, the other day, my wife here in the lab, when we were told about the church, I will not say where in case I'm going to go to the church. Where, 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 where one day, the people were counting, the people who were counting money. Then the wife of the pastor came with a big bag, took all the bags and poured the money, poured the money, poured the money. He was saying, Dada, Mom, Mama Kanisa, what is it? Says, why are you there when you started the church? <laughs> and then their job was over. Now, you need to understand, and by the way, the following Sunday they were declared, not 
be that thing more. Really? I'm talking about the real case. Because for sure, they were in the wrong. What were they doing in that person's church? You have no business in somebody's church. Go to Christ's church. And in Christ's church, all of us are just holy by Jesus. He is the head of the church. And it's very important to understand that. Obviously, I'm not suggesting you don't start your position. But don't call it a church, surely. Because church, the Bible is what a church actually is. And a church, nobody is the owner of the church. A Christ remains the owner. And he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good Samaritan. We are all in. Okay, his Please go ahead. Uh, my question is about the uh, model of church governance that you are, I see like you are very much advocating for 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 uh, the Presbyterian system. Uh, I haven't said so. That's what you fear I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you allow me to read there, my good friend? But ask the question. So by the time my I question is, what about these other models? Because I know they are they, 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 they are strength and weaknesses that of all types. Recognize in uh, all in even this uh, model of. Uh, uh, a board of elders. So, uh, so far, I've not described the elders at all. <laughs> That's what you are fearing. All I'm giving are principles. And the principles are that no one person can claim to own a church. That means if that guy got, dies, the church yes. continues. If, 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 if continue to dies, if he's the owner. Yes. That is not a biblical basis for a church. Whatever option you go for, Congregational, Presbyterian, ensure that nobody other than Christ owns the church. That's the principle I'm teaching. I'm not going to which one, which one you follow. I'm just giving the very core principles. And you can see clearly there enough, there's enough information in Christ keeping repeating. I'm the head of the church. church. That's it, there's enough information. Are we in disagreement on that one? No. No, it's clear. Yeah, so that, that, that's, a, that's a... Now, how you go work out the details, I'm not about to enter that. That's a trap. And I'm not about to enter into the trap. <laughs> now, because you can have Presbyterians, but the Presbyterians, the elders own the church. Mm, yeah. They give the pastor a very rough time. Mm. Have you heard of those things? Yeah. Yes. Because they now own... Church. I'm here to give the peaceful. The pastors don't own the church. The elders. The elders don't own the church. The church, the church belongs to Christ. That's what I say, but no, I'm not saying anything. That is, what you are hearing is what I was about to say. That's what I've been saying. Am I right? That's what I've been, I've been saying, and it's important to, like, to understand. To understand um, but I, I wanted to emphasize the plurality of leadership. That when I go through, even when you talk about Titus, it's, a, it's, a, it's being told to go to create and organize a church. He is still told to appoint, elders. not an elder, but elders. elders. And I'm telling you that a church of 20 other people. And they are not going to have one person. They are going to have several sharing the vision. That, that, that will be important. Now, to all God's holy people, as Philippians 1, 1 says, in Christ Jesus, at Philippi, together with overseers and deacons. I just wanted you to get to my point. The church at Philippi, I don't know how big it was. The letter is not being written to the vision bearer. <laughs> It's written, but when you read, read it in your, in your version, in case you don't agree with my version, you can some read Philippians 1 1 in their Bible. But I really want to we need to spend time on this foundation. King James. Yes, King James. Paul and, uh, uh, Paul and Timotheus the servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ 
beautiful person. We don't, we don't. All servants in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippines with the bishops and deacons. So her version says the same. Yes. There is not one person in charge of the church of Philippi. It is plural. I'm making my point. Yes. You know the reason I'm taking this time is because I know what I'm saying. It's likely to be new to you. Am I right? Yeah. It's new. It's not thought. The pastor doesn't want you to hear this. But then it reduces his power. He wants you to know the pastor are not here. They are seated here. Now, <laughs> so that's not something that is thought a lot. You want to know like there's some infection. But he is saying the letter is not written to a pastor. It's written to deacons, to bishops and deacons. Okay. Overseers. Paul does not greet pastor. Singular, or the overseer singular of the church in Philippi, but the overseers plural. Though the church he attended may have a pastor, this is not the teaching of the New Testament. And this idea of one person in charge is today a daily activity. Am I right? Yeah. But what I wanted you to understand, it was not the New Testament uh, foundation. Um, now, I, 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 I have just looked at my time I realize we don't have enough time. I want you to share with your neighbor answer to three questions. Question number one. In which way is your denomination having biblical foundation for leadership? In which way? Give, the, give two of your examples to show your denomination follows the biblical basis of leadership. Question number two. In which ways in, does it need to improve to be aligned to the biblical foundation of fellowship? Yeah, in which way? Now only you know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not from your church. <laughs> so the first one is, we have been talking about this foundation recently. I want to evaluate your own church, not somebody else's, your own. And please, sorry, congratulate yourself <coughs> that your church is in line with the biblical foundation. In this way and this way and this way. Then be critical. You are critical yourself. Here and here and here we need to improve. What are those areas? Third question. What do you do about it? 